I think too often we don't focus on envisioning the, the future we want to create. Um, so, I mean, for me, I'm on a mission to create a world where the air around us is safe for everybody to breathe. Um, and that means living in a city that's cleaner and greener, where there's more cycling, um, where walking is safe, where public transport is easy and affordable and emission free. Hello, this is Barbara Humpton. CEO of Siemens USA. Welcome to the Optimistic Outlook podcast. Over the last three episodes, we've gone in depth thinking about how we can help America's educational institutes get healthier for the future. And now it's Earth Month, and we're turning our attention to the topic of climate. Think about climate change. We know that the decade ahead of us needs to be one of action. And in fact, even as we grapple with the pandemic, air pollution has emerged as the fourth biggest global factor in our health, claiming 7 million lives annually. It's stunning. And it's something that we really know we need to address. It's something we have the technology to address. Today, I'm really proud to have one of the world-renowned experts in the subject with us. And she's here today to think with us with an optimistic outlook. Jane Burston, she's the executive director and founder of the Clean Air Fund. It's based in the UK. And you'll also hear from our, another of our UK colleagues, Martin Powell. He's our head of sustainability in the Americas in Siemens Financial Services. Give a listen. Martin, here we are talking about air quality and the transition from fossil fuels. Is that a fossil burning, fireplace behind you. Behind me is uh, a traditional log burner. We don't put logs in it. We put carbon neutral fuels in it. It has a particulate trap and filter on it. So we collect any harmful particulates. A house I should add is powered entirely electrically by an air source heat pump. And we have a fully green electricity tariff. So this is in effect a carbon neutral home. Thanks for the clarification, and I know those who are watching us on video will appreciate knowing. Jane, earlier this year, you wrote an open letter, really setting up the challenge, telling us to step up to the next decade as we address the climate challenge. And as we know, there's a real nexus between climate change and air quality. I'd love to know your background, how you came to this topic yourself. Well, if there's a single moment um, to pinpoint it to, I think it was lying on the road um, at mile 25 of the Chicago Marathon. Um, it was a super hot day. I don't know whether any of your listeners will, will remember. I think it was 2007 or 8. And um, I'd collapsed from heat exhaustion like thousands of others. And um, as I was being stretched into the ambulance that day, it really made me think, you know, if I survive this experience, what do I want to spend the rest of my life doing? And I promised myself then that if I did make it uh, out of the hospital, I would dedicate my life to issues that I really cared about. Um, so on returning home, I, uh, I quit my job and uh, started to, to lead real change for our environment and our planet. That is a wonderful example of a life why being turned into a work why. And, and we're so delighted that you have dedicated your time, talent, and attention to this. And, you know, there's been a huge focus on decarbonization writ large. And I, we have been talking less about the connection of decarbonization to just the simple thought of clean air. And yet, you know that, that there is this incredible tie. And, and so I'm interested in how you and the Clean Air Fund are addressing the issue. Yeah, well, for me, um, climate change and, and air quality are very closely linked. Um, I mean, scientifically, they're closely linked because about two thirds of air pollution is from burning fossil fuels. And obviously, we know that it's fossil fuels that are the major cause of the greenhouse gases that are warming our planet. Um, so for me, it's not really an either or, it's, it's a both and. Um, I mean, I, I started first kind of being aware of and thinking about air quality when I moved to London just after I graduated university. And um, I was cycling around, I had one of those uh, cyclists masks. Um, and at the end of the week, the filter that was on the back of that would turn black. And it made me think, goodness me, this is going into our lungs. 
So it, it wasn't until um, most recently at the Clean Air Fund that I started working on air pollution full time. But I did it because of this link with climate change and the fact that addressing the causes of air pollution can help us both solve climate change and tackle the health impacts at the same time. I think it's, there's huge win-wins there. Mm -hmm. Both and. I couldn't agree more. And I want to draw Martin into the conversation now because, Martin, you've led sustainability efforts both in the public and private sectors. But I know you've had a personal connect a connection to ensuring that all people have the ability to breathe clean air. Tell us about that. Yeah, thank you. A couple of uh, stories. One um, dates back to my days in London government. Uh, we published a study showing the number of premature deaths per year uh, as a result of poor air quality. And that number um, was 4,267. I still remember that to this day. That's the number of premature deaths per year. Um, and I spent two weeks having to talk to the Evening Standard, to BBC News, to all sorts of different uh, stakeholders. Um, uh, about these topics, it was really, um, it just opened people's mind to something that uh, I've now been targeting for, for, for many years. Perhaps the, the personal point is that my daughter has uh, asthma, um, my wife has adult onset asthma, and on bad air days, um, they are the canaries in the coal mine. I mean, this link is direct, it's very clear. I see the physical uh, effects uh, on both my daughter and my wife of a bad air day. Uh, it's not the most sophisticated measuring system, but it's, it's very clear. It has a physical impact uh, on all of us. So I guess the rest of us uh, miners should heed that warning um, and leave the coal mine. Um, one in 13 people in the US have asthma. Um, that's 25 million Americans, uh, it's a similar number close to one in 13 in the UK. And I just would like to draw your attention to one study. Um, around this time last year, when the pandemic took hold, uh, a study from uh, Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health uh, used the link between air pollution uh, and COVID deaths to illustrate that if in New York City, the uh, levels of fine particulate matter, that's the PM 2.5, were 11 micrograms instead of 12 micrograms, and, and we sustained that for the last 20 years or so, that there would have been significantly fewer COVID uh, deaths. And I can assure you in May last year, and I was living in New York at that time, that level was down to four micrograms, um, PM 2.5, uh, which, which is phenomenally lower than the, the, the norm. So really, you know, no cars, no buses on the road really shows um, how we can get those levels down to something reasonable. Yeah, what Martin is pointing out to us is that, you know, we do have people all around us. Maybe we ourselves are experiencing the effects of the air quality and its effects on our health. And yet, Martin, you're speaking in terms of measurements that not many of us are familiar with. Jane, I'd love to understand better how is it that we measure air quality and how is it that we see variations across countries around the world, perhaps in developing countries with a smaller carbon footprint, their air quality could actually be worse than maybe in some developed countries. Can you give us some, some insight into how all of this is measured? Yes, absolutely. Um, I agree. Measuring, measuring data on air quality is one of the core building blocks for achieving change on it. Um, the normal way of doing the measurements is quite expensive. Um, so in the UK or the US, for example, there are regulatory grade monitors, hundreds of thousands of dollars on um, street corners in and around cities, usually not huge numbers of them. And um, usually national science labs or local authorities will uh, use those measurements to determine what the uh, outdoor concentrations of different sorts of pollutants are. Um, even though that's a really expensive and difficult thing to do, it's still not enough because air pollution can differ quite a bit from one street to the next. 
um, because some of it, especially particulate matter, kind of hangs quite low in the air, you get what's called an urban canyon effect, and it doesn't really blow from street to street, it, it stays trapped. So ideally, we'd want to know what the air pollution is on individual streets so that people can avoid the areas with the highest pollution and maybe walk and cycle along the areas with lower pollution. Um, many countries, though, can't even afford the, um, the regulatory grade monitoring. And actually, there's an NGO called OpenAQ, which is a brilliant source of um, the government grade monitoring that's available worldwide. And in their recent report, it said that only 10 of 52 African countries have any monitoring at all. Um, I think what's encouraging is there's quite a bit of development of technology. So we've seen um, over the last decade a huge boom in um, the in smaller sensors, um, which you could potentially use to measure people's exposure. Um, obviously, if, if monitors are regularly kind of on a street corner or tied to a lamppost, it's impossible uh, without modelling to then say, how much pollution am I exposed to in my life? Whereas if I was wearing a sensor that will be a lot easier to do. Um, and these new sensors, as well as being um, portable, um, are also a lot lower cost. So cities like London are experimenting with using them. They're, not, they're never going to replace the regulatory grade monitors because they're much more accurate. But it's going to be interesting to see how we can use these lower cost monitors as part of a network uh, to see what our exposure is and get more granular data. I'm sure that air pollution affects all of us, but are there certain segments of the world population who are more susceptible? Yeah, um, I think many people are surprised when they find out that air pollution has a disproportionate effect on children's health. Um, but it makes sense because children are more exposed. They spend lots of time outside and the concentrations of pollutants are often higher, closer to the ground at the height of a toddler or a child in a buggy. Um, babies breathe four times as fast as adults and young children twice as fast. So they're breathing in more air per kilo of body weight as adults do. And they're also more vulnerable physiologically because they're growing. Their brain is growing, their lungs are growing, and air pollution can significantly restrict uh, the development of organs. Um, so your, your listeners may have heard that in the UK, we've had this landmark case recently um, where a little girl who died from an asthma attack has uh, now been found to have died because of air pollution. And for the first time, we think globally, air pollution will be written as a cause of death on her death certificate. Um, her name's Ella Kissy Deborah, and she grew up along one of London's busiest and most congested roads. She went to school just nearby there, and she really suffered incredibly badly from asthma. Um, in the coroner's court, we heard that of the, the 27 times that she was hospitalized in the last three years of her life, the vast majority of those were on days where pollution around her home was high. So her mother, Rosamond, has um, been campaigning so that local authorities do much more to tackle air pollution in the UK and that no child and no family will have to suffer like Ella um, and her family have done. Oh, Jane, that's heartbreaking. And I can just say, as a grandmother, I'm, I'm captivated and thinking about my own little grandchildren and the world that they're growing into right now. Jane, according to measurements that have been taken, we know that there have been huge improvements over the last 30 years, but it seems that in, especially in developed countries, the progress has stalled. What do you think is behind that and what do we need to do next? Um, I, I agree. There's there's a kind of plateauing of emissions in a number of um, developed countries. And actually, in many countries in the world, outdoor air pollution and the health impacts of it are going through the roof. Um, so I find it shocking and surprising how little people know about air pollution when the World Health Organization says that it causes 15% of all deaths every year. Um, why has it stalled? I think... Politicians possibly put it in the too difficult to handle box um, or in, in some of the countries that you're, you're mentioning, some of the more developed countries, maybe there's a feeling that it's already been tackled. Lots of the visible pollution has gone uh, often from our cities and it might be a case of out of sight, out of mind. Um, 
I think what's encouraging is that actually there seems to be a huge amount of momentum around air pollution at the moment. If you look at charts of new research, uh, there's exponential increase in publications on the topic. Um, same with the media talking about it. It's in the news all of the time um, in the UK. And um, we did a Clean Air Fund did a survey during the first lockdown about how, how aware people were of pollution and how concerned they were. And in many countries around the world, more than two thirds of people said that it was their second top public health concern after infectious uh, disease. So given you know, being in the midst of the pandem pandemic, that's a really very high number. So I think there's, there's lots of encouraging signs there. Once people care, politicians often follow closely behind um, and people are making their voices heard. So um, we have, we have uh, huge optimism about the amount of action that's gonna happen over the next decade. Yeah, we share that optimism at Siemens. It's clear that bringing these things to top of mind for citizens around the world really is helping political and business decision makers do the right thing. And, and with that, I'd like to turn to Martin and let's dig a little bit into the kinds of solutions that are available. We know that uh, some of the largest emitters in the world are part of our infrastructure and real change needs to be made there. What are some of the solutions available to us? Yeah, thanks. There's a, a raft of solutions. Um, I mentioned the impact of having no cars or buses. Um, this isn't a, a future reality. The, the cars will return to our streets. But if, if they were to be um, clean tailpipe emissions, uh, that's going to make a huge impact. Um, you still have pollution from uh, brake and tire wear, but this would, would make some uh, huge improvements in, in local air pollution. Um, NO2 and NOx levels in big cities are high, uh, so this shift to renewable energy will directly reduce that level. Um, again, these distributed solar solutions uh, on our schools, our hospitals, um, public buildings, uh, commercial buildings will really help speed up that transition. Um, there are some powerful levers that big cities can use as well. Congestion pricing, um, uh, which they've just now announced in New York, low emission zone technologies uh, really will drive down emissions, particularly in those areas that are worse affected. So um, providing some, some direct hotspot benefit uh, there as well. And on top of that, they provide real revenue uh, for investment in public transport. So we can now provide more efficient, affordable alternatives for people in the city. So, so the, you know, the co-benefit here is that social dimension where we can reduce uh, inequality through these solutions as well. Um, and then these focus areas, these hotspots I talked about, um, I've seen a great example in Los Angeles, a uh, high pollution highway from the port of LA, um, filled with heavy trucks um, and they funded an uh, e-highway solution so the trucks run electrically with a pantograph uh, and an overhead line um, improving the quality of life for all those people living uh, in those areas on the side of, uh, of that main highway so you know thinking about this from a super local level as well as a local level um, is really going to help move us forward. Jane, I'd, I'd love your thoughts on the connection between this discussion we're having, the idea of clean air uh, and, and improving equity in our communities. Am I, am I thinking about it correctly that uh, when we think about something as simple as electric mobility and renewable power, is it that by cleaning the air everywhere or by cleaning the air in certain corridors, we're actually improving the quality of life for others? Yes, that's that's right. I think um, equity is often at the heart of um, air quality issues, because usually the mo the poorest and most vulnerable are also the most exposed. Um, that's true globally. Um, it's the least developed countries that have the the highest and growing levels of air pollution, um, but it's also true. Um, in any given country or city, it's the, the lowest income communities and the low, lowest income families that end up um, 
not being able to afford houses in areas where there's more parks and more likely to be living right underneath a big highway or right next door to an industrial facility. Um, so, and, and also those groups um, are the least likely to be the sources of pollution. They're the least likely to own a vehicle, for example. So equity is really at the, at the heart of this. Um, I think, you know, based on what Martin was saying before as well about some of the respiratory conditions that um, air pollution causes, like asthma, we know that people who, are, um, who suffer the worst from COVID are the, the people who've got those pre-existing conditions. And low-income communities also tend to have the least access to... Um, to the health facilities. So I think there's a, there's a huge point around health inequalities. What we have to be careful of uh, when we're implementing so solutions is to make sure that they're equitable too. Um, not everybody can afford an electric vehicle. Um, not everybody can afford congestion charging or clean air zone charging. And so for people who are reliant on their vehicle, maybe can't afford to upgrade it, but are completely reliant on it, either because they have a disability or because they need it for work and there's no sources of public transport, we really have to make sure that these policies accommodate their needs too and that the policies and solutions are equitable um, as, we're, as we're cleaning the air for everybody. Yeah, this lens of equity comes back over and over again. And I've been very encouraged to hear people in so many different areas, with so many different uh, areas of expertise and focus, really talk about this as something that is intertwined with the changes ahead. So this lens of equity as we approach the future is gonna help us devise some creative solutions. But Martin, how are we going to pay for all of this? The, the topic that keeps coming up over and over again is how in the world will we finance the change that we envision? I've heard you know, estimates from the World Economic Forum that in essence, the trillions required each year to achieve the sustainable development goals really can't be met by any government alone or any business alone, of course, and all the NGOs in the world together can't accomplish this. How are you looking at this from a financial perspective? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I think the next 10 years, um, the finance community uh, you know, will, will have to really step up and understand how to generate the pace and scale required to uh, deliver this transition to much cleaner cities, but you know, also to those solutions that I've talked about. Um, cities are taking advantage of green bonds and we're seeing a, 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 a phenomenal increase in this market. Uh, energy retrofits, new energy infrastructure can all be financed with uh, guarantees on those outcomes. And I think that's um, going to be key. Uh, the pace and scale of distributed energy projects um, can be achieved. I think the US rejoining the Paris Agreement has been extremely good for the world. Um, uh, the US is the sort of powerhouse of finance community and, and um, you know, hopefully we can start seeing these fund structures set up to allow us to um, run these, these schemes across the hospital, schools, railway stations, university campuses, you know, could all benefit from these clean energy projects. Um, and I think the big topic today is the, the ESG commitments from business. Um, the need to transition to a zero carbon economy can, can all be financed. Um, you know, Businesses need to understand this pathway for uh, their role to turn to, to greener solutions. Um, the provision of sustainability linked loans, this is a fabulous concept that uh, bring reductions in the loan rate as the improvements are made. And I think generally, and Jane touched on this, but if we monitor our environment more than we are today, we can assess our impact more and good data really does support investment. Uh, but it also means it's really harder not to act if we can understand exactly what's happening to us. Jane, is there anything you'd like to add? So what's really exciting is that one of the benefits of tackling air pollution is that it will actually save us money. Um, obviously, there's huge health costs associated with treating all of the people who've got illnesses uh, derived from them breathing in air pollution or illnesses that are exacerbated on a daily basis by air pollution. Um, 
and we can avoid those health and social care costs if pollution comes down. There's also a huge productivity benefit for businesses. Obviously, when air pollution makes people sick, they can't go to work. If it makes their kids sick, they can't go to work because they're at home looking after their children. And even though the deaths from air pollution are uh, more skewed towards the older population, there are a really large number of working age people um, who die because they've been they've been um, because of the pollution. So, um, I mean, for example, just in the UK, the Confederation of British Industry calculated that if the UK dropped its pollution levels to in line with what the WHO says is safe. Um, that the UK economy would save £1.6 billion uh, a year and uh, 3 million working days a year. So there are huge economic benefits to the government from social health and social care costs, but also to businesses from uh, the productivity gains. That's a really compelling business case. And we've been learning from our three-part series on education that translate that then into indoor air quality. And we actually see cognitive ability improve in individuals. So we have lots of reasons to be tackling this in order to really help advance the, the progress we're making, the economies in our countries, there's a real potential here. So uh, let me see if I understand you correctly. If we are doing more measuring and monitoring, if we can get the data to help inform us and apply technologies that will enable us to reduce emissions, uh, build, build a cleaner future, generate cleaner air, Frankly, with the help of funding and financing that's going to come from a lot of creative areas, we have a picture of a healthier and, and more sustainable future. Jane, I'd love to hear from you. What does that future look like? Well, that's a, that's a great and positive question. Um, I think too often we don't focus on envisioning the, the future we want to create. Um, so, I mean, for me, I'm on a mission to create a world where the air around us is safe for everybody to breathe. Um, and that means living in a city that's cleaner and greener, where there's more cycling, um, where walking is safe, where public transport is easy and affordable and emission free. And the city that I'm imagining is friendlier, it's easier to get around, it's more human centred and um, we're, we're alleviated from this, this worry and these burdensome health conditions that we have. Hey Jane, we want to live with you in that world and we want to help you build it too. Thank you so much for being with us today and Martin, thank you for joining us. Wow, many thanks to Jane and Martin. And it's, I've learned so much in this conversation with them. It's really got me thinking, we're at a time where we need to align our actions. And here we sit at this moment when we are recovering, we're, we're getting the economy restarted and we're making investments. This is now a chance when we can increase the monitoring for understanding where we are in terms of air quality in our communities and our businesses. It's also a time when we can share that information, be more vocal about it, and we can use our voices to reach out to decision makers, policy makers, legislators, who can help us create the frameworks that will help us build a healthier future. Thanks for listening in, and I hope you'll go to our show notes. We'll direct you to the Clean Air Fund and to our environmental action page, as well as resources we've been sharing during Earth Month. Thanks so much for listening. Thank you for tuning in. Subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or to the Siemens YouTube channel. And for show notes and more, go to Siemens.com slash optimist.